So good morning and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much for signing up and tuning into this very exciting webinar today. Uh, we will begin shortly. We'll give you um, attendees uh, a minute or two to come online and get settled. So we will begin shortly. Thank you. Okay, so it looks like we have a significant number of attendees. So good morning, uh, good afternoon or good evening, and thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Mina Epps and I work for IUCN's uh, Global Marine and Polar Program. And we're very excited um, to be hosting yet another webinar. We've been hosting a um, webinar since June together with the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative and uh, IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law and Oceans and Coast and, and Coral Reef Specialist Group. So this is part of an initiative to really build the momentum uh, between the IGC3 and IGC4. So we've been hosting a series of webinars and, and we're very delighted to have you uh, with us today as well for uh, a webinar on building ecological and institutional resilience in the ocean via the BBNJ agreement. Um, what we have today is actually a very exciting lineup of speakers, or we can call them ocean heroes. They are not only expert, they're also very passionate about their field. Um, so we also have the pleasure to invite His, His Excellency Ambassador Odo Tevi from Vanuatu, uh, who has since 2004 been part of the permanent uh, rep representative to the United Nations uh, in New York. Um, and apart from his role um, as ambassador, Tevi also assumes other international roles at the UN. He's also the vice president of the UN General Assembly and chairman of UN Disarmament Commission. Um, and he's also been the chairman of Asia Pacific Group, and he's currently on the executive board of UNDP, UNFPA and UNOX. So we would very much be very grateful to have you uh, together with us today, Ambassador. Um, followed by a keynote address from the ambassador, we will also invite our other speakers today. And we would um, like to start off with um, um, uh, Siddharth uh, Shakar, who's Yadav, who's actually uh, a co-author of this very important paper that was released recently. Um, the, the paper uh, that we will be building today's discussion on uh, focuses on the ocean, climate change and resilience making oceans be areas beyond national jurisdiction more resilient to climate change and other anthropogenic impacts and activities. So um, um, Sidar Chakar Yadav is also part of the permanent mission of the Republic of Vanuatu to the United Nations. He's also an advisor to the ambassador on climate change, ocean and biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. And uh, we also together as a co-author of this paper is Christina Yarde, who's IUCN's senior high seas advisor, uh, who's also been engaged uh, in this space for many, many, many years and probably don't need an introduction to many. Uh, followed by the presentation of the paper, we will also hear from Andrew Murray, who's joining us from Stockholm. He's part of, he's, uh, he's based at Stockholm Resilience Center, and he's focusing on governance on the global ocean um, and working on the interface of science, policy, and communication as a research liaison um, and this has been very exciting, so he will also show us some visuals, so we will have some very uh, enlightening and interesting uh, visuals to uh, indulge in as well. Uh, we will then move into also Q&A session, and I'm very happy and pleased to uh, welcome, and I will be handing over to my colleague, um, Dr. Aurélie Spadon, who's been working uh, with us with IUCN for over 10 years on high seas, um, different issues related to sea months, um, etc. I've mean, also been following the BBNJ negotiation uh, also on our behalf. So without any further delay, um, I would like to actually start by handing over to His Excellency, uh, Ambassador Odo Tevi. Uh, please, the floor is yours. We look forward to your welcoming uh, and keynote uh, address. Thank you very much.
Ambassador, I'm sorry, but you're um, you're muted. Can we just ask you to unmute your microphone and we'd love to listen to what you began with. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, Hello? thank you. That's perfect. Well, let me first uh, thank the chair and also thank the authors of this uh, article on the oceans. Uh, we, we are all aware of the uh, pivotal role that the ocean plays in supporting, in supporting life on Earth. It is widely known that the ocean provides uh, ecosystem uh, services that are vital for life on our pl planet. From regulating the ocean's climate to providing more than half of the planet's uh, oxygen. The ocean is home to an incredibly rich biodiversity and the largest ecosystem on Earth. From providing food security to being the cornerstone of international trade and communication, the ocean plays a key role in human su survival and well being as well. The ocean provides a range of opportunities for sustainable growth. For small island developing states in the Pacific region, like my country, the ocean is not only important in terms of food security, employment, transport, communication, and economic development, but it is integral part of our history, culture, and identity. The ocean defi defines us as Pacific people. However, our future is in danger as the health and resilience of the global ocean is at risk. The ocean is under the threat from the impacts of climate change and other anthropogenic activities, including unsustainable use of the ocean stemming from overfishing, shipping, pollution, destruction of marine habitats and ecosystems, and the cumulative impacts. More than 60% of the ocean that lies in areas beyond national jurisdiction is particularly vulnerable to the multitude of growing anthropogenic threats. The Imaging uh, Treaty for the Conservation and Sustainable Use of Marine Diversity of Areas Beyond National Jurisdiction that was launched to fill the gaps in the existing ABNJ governance framework provides a golden opportunity to build resilience in ABNJ. The need for enhancing ocean re resilience is greater than ever before. The BBNJ Treaty could contribute to this in a number of ways, including protecting marine biodiversity and connecting through effectively managed area-based conservation measures, ensuring participation of diverse stakeholders in the decision-making process, preserving traditional knowledge, building capacities and access to technology, and fostering the collaborative, collaborative governance mechanisms more suitable for resilience building. The risk of missing this historic opportunity are too great. The ocean is at a tipping point and the small island developing states are at the extreme front lines of this global emergency. Protecting, protecting the ocean is a matter of global agency. Our future depends on it. Thank you. Mina, you muted. I'm sorry. Okay, you can hear me now. Thank you very much, Ambassador Tevi, for your time and for your engagement for all that work that you're doing on oceans and for being with us here today, not only emphasizing that the ocean's at a tipping point and sharing some of the island state perspectives. Uh, which are actually at the forefront of seeing these impacts. So once again, thank you very much for being uh, here with us today. Um, so what we're going to do now, I'm going to be handing over to my colleague, Aurelie Spadon, who will actually introduce uh, the next speaker. Um, we will go move on to the next speaker uh, of authors to hear a presentation about the newly published paper. 
And this will then be followed by another presentation by Dr. Murray. Uh, and there will be opportunities to, to uh, ask questions and so that will be um, managed by my colleagues. Um, and then we we'll also will be have a listening to Christina Yarda a little bit later as well. So a packed agenda with lots of uh, ocean heroes with lots of passion. So over to you, Aurélie. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mina, and thank you again, Ambassador. And uh, we we know that uh, I mean the the BBNG agreement is definitely of huge importance for the future of small island developing states. So many thanks again from all of us and for your time and, and commitment. And um, our um, I would like to uh, point. In the, in, indicate you that you can already uh, ask your questions. I mean, during the whole presentation in the question uh, box on the control panel, and the panel of speakers will answer them uh, after the presentation. So our first speaker today is Siddharth Shekhar Yadav, and um, uh, today Siddharth will be presenting the key points from his article, uh, co-author uh, Christina Jordi, on the ocean climate change and resilience making oceans areas beyond national jurisdiction more resilient to climate change and other anthropogenic activities. So over to you, Sid. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, before I start, I just wish to check if you can uh, hear me well and see me. Perfectly well, Sid. Thank you. Great. Great. Uh, thank you, Mina, for the introduction, and thank you, um, Oli, as well. Uh, it is indeed a great pleasure and honor for me to be here today. Uh, I'd like to thank the IUCN and DOSI for organizing the webinar, and I would also like to thank His Excellency Ambassador Odo Tey for, for his time and for his uh, insightful remarks. Thank you. So I was just wondering if I could have my presentation now on the screen, please. Sorry, uh, Tony, I was just wondering if you're able to hear me. Sit. Uh, Tony has a problem with his computer, but I'm going to put on uh, the, the slide. Great. So just bear with me a couple of minutes. Sure, and I that's put fine. My screen. Thank you. Thank you, Oli. Appreciate that. Thanks. Looks like your presentation is on, Sid. Uh, actually, um, this is the invitation, I guess. If you, I think it might be the next one. Ah, Perfect. Okay. Yeah, I can see it now. So everyone can, uh, everyone can see the slides, I hope, now. Great. Um, so now if you could just move on to the next slide, please, um, Aureli. Appreciate that. Perfect. So in the next few minutes, I'll be presenting the key points from our article on Ocean, uh, ocean Resilience and the High Seas Treaty. Um, authored by Christina and myself, and you can find a link to the article at the bottom of the slide. Uh, next one, please. So, uh, as we all know, and as the ambassador highlighted, our ocean is threatened from climate change and other anthropogenic activities, including unsustainable use, uh, stemming from overexploitation, pollution from a range of sources, as well as other pressures and also their cumulative and interacting impacts as well, just as the figure on the next slide would show. Uh, so Aureli, please, if you could move on. Right, um, so this figure shows how the three uh, primary consequences of climate change on the ocean, that is warming, acidification, and deoxygenation, interact and overlap with other human activities. Now, uh, due to the time limit, it may not be possible to discuss each one of these impacts separately, but uh, it's all discussed in the article in detail. Uh, next one, please, Aureli. 
So um, we know that uh, strong decreases in greenhouse gas emissions are urgently required in order to address these issues, but um, that alone will not be sufficient. We need additional steps under a wider uh, resilience approach, and this resilience approach and principles uh, will help us not only in addressing these issues, but also in uh, increasing the ability of the ocean institutions to respond. So uh, the concept of resilience is, is generally seen as the ability of a system to absorb shocks and change and recover from it, as well as to continue to adapt and develop. So the, it is the ability uh, of the system to retain its uh, core functions and identity, its key identity in the face of change. And in terms of uh, socio-ecological resilience and ecosystem services, Biggs et al. have defined resilience as the capacity of a socio-ecological system to reliably sustain ecosystem services in the face of change. Now, uh, it's important to note that there is a limit to how much change a system can absorb uh, before it shifts to an alternative state. So the resilience approach looks at ecosystems uh, not as static identities, entities that will always return to a, uh, equilibrium, but as adaptive systems that will um, uh, uh, that may go through a regime shift and form new feedbacks and um, give new uh, ecosystem services. Uh, next one, please. Already. So um, the the question is now. Um, how to enhance this capacity, how to build resilience. So uh, there is substantial literature on resilience, as well as the key tools and uh, principles to build resilience in the ecosystem, um, socio-ecological systems. And um, Christina and I have used seven such principles. These seven principles have been developed by the Stockholm Resilience Center. And uh, Christina and I have uh, applied these res uh, seven resilience principles in the ocean areas beyond national jurisdiction, keeping in mind the emerging DBNJ agreement. And just, just wish to emphasize that the goal here is to build both the biological resilience in ecosystems, as well as the institutional resilience in, in governance systems. Uh, next one, please. So here you can see all the seven resilience principles, and we'll discuss each one of them. Uh, so if you could please move on to the next, uh, next slide, already. <clears throat> Great. So um, let us start with the, with the principle that has a really important place in the resilience literature. This is maintaining diversity and redundancy of components in a socio-ecological system. Now, um, in a socio-ecological system, different components uh, such as species, human actors, and institutions provide different ways, they provide diverse ways of dealing with shocks and change. Therefore, a system with many different components has, uh, is generally more resilient than a system with fewer components, because a system with many different components has more ways of responding to change. Um, it has more ways for um, compensating for the lost and failed components. So um, diversity thus helps in maintaining the essential ecosystem services under a wide range of conditions. Now, now, the good thing is that this diversity is already present in the ocean in an abundance. Uh, marine life is comprised of multiple levels of diversity, which includes diversity in species, diversity... Uh, by the way, Aurelie, if you could please move on to the next slide as well. Thank you. So, as I was saying, uh, uh, the marine life is comprised of uh, multiple levels of diversity, including diversity of species, diversity within species and um, diversity uh, of ecosystems. And this diversity is also threatened by climate change and other human activities, uh, such as especially overfishing. So um, next one, please. So um, we know that the key tools uh, for protecting diversity include uh, integrated uh, ecosystem-based approaches to management, uh, as well as other area-based uh, conservation measures, such as marine protected areas. So in the article, we've shown um, that uh, the PBNJ uh, treaty should accordingly prioritize uh, establishment of highly protected MPAs, as well as MPA networks, and strong protection measures via other types of area-based conservation, uh, conservation measures, such as 
which are part of a larger, uh, wider seascape planning initiatives, will be useful as well. And um, this principle, this principle of diversity and redundancy, not only applies to species and ecosystems, but it also applies to um, institutions and governance systems as well, which means that um, participation of a diversity of stakeholders in the BBNJ um, institutional mechanisms and um, decision-making mechanisms will be essential for building resilience. And we'll discuss more on this under principle six on uh, broadening participation. Um, next slide, please, uh, Aurelie. Now, the second principle is uh, managing connectivity. And in the article, we focus on marine ecological uh, connectivity, which is the way uh, in which uh, marine ecosystems, as well as components of marine ecosystems, are um, connected, uh, the way in which they interact in time, uh, in time and space. So um, this uh, uh, marine ecological uh, connectivity is mainly established by ocean currents and uh, marine species. So uh, ocean currents can connect uh, distant ocean regions and areas uh, beyond national jurisdiction to each other, as well as to the coastal zones. And similarly, connectivity uh, is established by um, active swimming and migration of these marine species to uh, multiple places for, for feeding, breeding, and um, other life history stages. And also, it's important to note that this system of connections is not only horizontal, but it's also vertical, which means that the different uh, depths of the ocean are connected as well. Um, uh, next one, please. So if, if we look at the BBNJ treaty, uh, we'll find that connectivity is mainly addressed under the uh, objectives and criteria for identification of areas under the second element. Now, it is, it is crucial that the uh, objectives of this uh, second element of ABMTs in the treaty is to establish ecologically representative MPAs that are connected, that are connected and effectively managed. And this is important because well-connected systems of uh, protected areas can help in a number of ways, including um, safeguarding habitats for migratory species, uh, allowing for uh, genetic exchange between populations, facilitating species movements, and also help with climate mitigation and resilience. Uh, next slide, please, Aureli. And also, um, I wish to emphasize that there are other forms of area-based management tools, including um, a range of static and dynamic measures um, to protect uh, connectivity corridors, which is useful in ensuring um, connectivity uh, of ecosystems, habitats, and species, to, to also ensure that this type of connectivity is, is maintained outside of MPAs as well. Uh, next one, please. Now, the third principle is about uh, managing slow variables and feedbacks. So slow variables are um, ecological variables that control the configuration of a socio-ecological system. And they're referred to as slow variables uh, because um, they change much more gradually as compared to fast variables. So I'll give you an example. A fast variable could be um, uh, crop production while uh, the soil composition is a slow variable. And feedbacks uh, are, are two-way connectors between these slow variables that can either amplify or reduce change in a socio-ecological system. Now, some of these feedback mechanisms are vital in maintaining some very useful and very important ecosystem services. But uh, again, as I have already mentioned, there is a limit, there is a critical threshold to how much change these systems can absorb before they um, go through a regime shift, which, uh, which is essentially going through a sudden abrupt change, forming new feedbacks and providing different ecosystem services. Uh, next slide, please. Therefore, a better understanding of uh, slow variables, a better, better knowledge and uh, better learning about key slow variables and feedbacks is, is very important. And um, since this is linked to the wider learning processes and um, uh, ocean science, we'll discuss more on this uh, under principle five on encouraging learning. So uh, Aureli, if you could please uh, move on two slides, two slides this time. Yeah, uh, one more, please. Yeah, please go on. Great, encouraging learning. So um, a continuous learning process is crucial for building resilience in socio-ecological systems. And um, 
this is mainly for for more than one reason. So first of all, um, it's, it's important to know that the socio-ecological systems are continuously changing. They are continuously um, undergoing development, which means that the knowledge that, uh, that we have of these systems is also changing and is, and is always uh, partial. It's always incomplete. And this is uh, particular uh, in the case of the ocean, as the ocean is undergoing many changes as well due to climate change and other human activities. And there's a second reason which makes learning and knowledge uh, even more important for the ocean. And that is the fact that most of the ocean is unexplored. Uh, there are major uh, scientific knowledge gaps uh, in terms of, for example, species, diversity, and um, key slow variables, uh, variables and feedbacks that we just talked about, deep sea and, and the ocean space. And I think it's, it's said that 95% of the ocean is still unknown and um, unseen. Therefore, we need, um, uh, if you could please move, uh, move on to the next slide as well uh, now, uh, really. So as you can see here, there are different uh, ways of um, uh, encouraging learnings, especially through research, exploration, long-term monitoring, and data sharing, other products of ocean science as well. Now, uh, Christina and I have um, shown in the article that a relevant action point for applying this principle could be the scientific and technical body under the BBNJ framework. So the scientific body can be enabled to acquire relevant scientific information uh, through a dedicated and coordinated research program uh, that ensures long-term monitoring. And also, uh, the BBNJ mechanisms need to be informed by the outcomes of the UN Decade of Ocean Science. This is really important. And um, also um, other global and regional scientific initiatives. Uh, next, please. So um, in addition to science, which is crucial, the role of which is crucial, um, we also need to utilize di diverse sources of knowledge, including local, indigenous, and traditional knowledge as well. And but the learning process goes beyond uh, this stage of data collection and um, collection of scientific information. It extends to how this scientific, uh, scientific information is shared uh, in the form of knowledge, how this scientific information is made accessible for, for strategies, for policy making, and, and for action. Also, um, the scientific concepts and these um, polytechnical terms related to uh, climate change, ocean, and resilience need to be translated to a language that is uh, free from jargon and um, uh, technical terms for the general public, as well as for, for those who are not experts in this field. Uh, next, please. Broadening participation. So uh, by participation, uh, we, uh, we mean the active engagement of the relevant stakeholders in the, uh, in the management and governance processes. And uh, participation of a diversity of stakeholders is set to enhance um, tr uh, build trust uh, relationships among different actors it improves knowledge base and decision making it also enhances shared learning uh, shared learning uh, understanding and learning which is essential for resilience now this is also linked with the principle one on maintaining diversity and redundancy because uh, diverse actors are capable of providing overlapping functions with different uh, different kinds of expertise, diverse perspectives and strengths. Uh, next, please. However, um, many are concerned that uh, the current BBNG nego negotiation process might have some limitations uh, with regard to this principle. For instance, uh, uh, many are concerned that um, the, 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 the negotiation process has not yet covered any forms of ex explicit criteria for active involvement of certain groups, such as uh, women, youth. And we've shown in the article that a relevant action point for this principle could be the, uh, could be the decision-making body under the BBNJ uh, agreement. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the uh, decision-making body could uh, provide avenues for participation of not only states, but also the civil society, NGOs, IGOs, the private sector, uh, academia, the scientific community, local indigenous, local and indigenous communities, women, youth, and other groups, and also 
uh, existing institutions as well, uh, like uh, such as conservation bodies, so CBD, Conservation on Biological Diversity, CMS, and also sectoral organizations. Uh, next, please. So before we uh, discuss uh, this principle, we, we, we're going to go back to principle four again. So Aurelie, if you could please go back uh, five slides, I think. To... Yeah, that's, that's perfect. So uh, the principle four is about um, complex adaptive systems approach. Now, um, it is important to note that the, govern the governance systems need to recognize the complexity and interconnectedness among ecosystems, uh, within the ecosystems, and because it is it is um, useful in being prepared uh, for uh, the changing external external changing conditions, and in this regard, a complex adaptive th uh, systems thinking approach is said to be useful. Um, also, uh, the short form is CAS, CAS approach. So the CAS approach um, is basically an approach that views the socio-ecological systems as complex adaptive systems. Which means, um, uh, next please, which means that it recognizes uh, the interconnectedness uh, and uh, complexity within the ecosystems. It um, accepts unpredictability, uncertainty, and it acknowledges all of this, um, as well as the resulting implications in the management processes. And also, uh, CAST thinking uh, supports governance measures rooted in diversity and uh, polycentricity. Which is going to be the next and the last principle. So um, please, really, if you could uh, go to the last principle again. Great. Um, so um, it's it's been observed that in order to manage these complex adaptive systems, uh, uh, a governance system involving polycentricity may be better suited. And many, many argue that um, a conventional focus on um, um, uh, uh, like a top-down and command and control approach will not be as effective as a polycentric system in the case of ocean governance, because polycentricity is set to enhance um, learning, innovation, adaptation, and trust among the different actors, as well as improve uh, connectivity uh, and develop policy and institutional diversity. However, scholars do note that polycentr uh, polycentricity may have its own challenges as well, which includes mainly uh, political conflicts um, and power imbalance and inconsistent policies. Uh, next, please. And these challenges, um, uh, many believe, are uh, more often the case than not in the current uh, polycentric governance of ABNJ. And a major challenge in this current governance is the lack of coordination, the lack of uh, integration and harmonization among the various uh, global, regional, and sectoral uh, stakeholders. In fact, uh, many existing institutions uh, act in divergent and conflicting values and principles. Uh, next, next one, please. And in order to achieve resilience through a polycentric system of uh, governance, in the case of ABNJ, a strong mandate is, is, is required in the BBNJ agreement for ensuring collaboration and coordination. And in order to ensure collaboration and co uh, uh, coordination, we need a shared set of overarching obligations, objectives, values, and principles. And the BBNJ uh, treaty mechanisms need to prioritize open communication, transparency, and broad participation, notable accountability, trust, and strong collaborative platforms. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, here is just a reminder of all the seven principles, and um, we'll be moving on to the last last slide, please, Aurelie. Yeah, so I, uh, this is a picture I took uh, in Micronesia, not very far from uh, Ponape, and I thought it would be a good uh, picture to conclude with. So thank you very much. And uh, if you need a copy of the article, uh, please feel free to uh, send us an email. We have uh, Christina, Christina's email as well as mine there. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you very thank you much. Already.
Thank you very much, Sid, for your great and very clear uh, presentation. And congratulations again to you and Christina for this excellent paper um, uh, that provides very concrete ways on how ocean resilience can be strengthened through the BBNG agreement. So thank our you, next thank speaker. You very much, thank you, Sid. So our next speaker uh, today is Andrew Mary. So Andrew will talk to us about how future scenarios can help in enhancing resilience in the ocean. So Andrew, if you're ready, over to you. I am, thank you. Uh, and I'll wiggle my hands and there we go, the slides come up. Uh, yeah, I'd like to uh, thank you, Aurelie and Mina for the introduction uh, and also to Christina and Sid for this excellent paper. And it's really great to be able to follow after that, you know, when you've taken such care to sort of think about the resilience principles in the context of the high seas. And of course, Your Excellency, thank you so much for your remarks and for being with us uh, today and for everyone else who's listening in. So we're going to now zoom out from uh, these resilience principles and think a little bit about what it, what is this ocean that we're, you know, trying to uh, work together to, to, uh, towards a better future. In. And I think it's important to put the context of the ocean in, uh, in place first. And this is the idea of the Anthropocene, the fact that humans are now the dominant force of uh, influence on the climate and the environment. And that really changes the way that we think about the ocean uh, and our relationship to it. So if we go to the next slide, uh, and what this means is that, you know, humans have changed the way the world works, and now we have to change the way we think about it too. Next slide, please. Okay, so what you should be seeing here coming up is a whole series of all the different ways in which we can see, if we can press the slide one more time. Yeah, great. So you can see that, you know, can ocean desalinization solve the world's water challenge? Can fertilizing the oceans reduce global, uh, global warming? We've seen new creatures in the ocean, ocean medicine, offshore oil and gas, the future of technology is hiding on the ocean floor, deep sea metals, diamond mining, Oceans, oceans, oceans. There's a sense that the oceans are our future. They are becoming more critically important for human well-being, uh, and therefore getting this right uh, in terms of the High Seas Treaty is critically important because you know you can see that there's this blue acceleration that many of the things that have happened on land are now happening in the oceans. You know we have from oil and gas exploration to uh, marine genetic resource sequences to uh, shipping to undersea cables, everything is increasing at exponential rates. Uh, and we sort of, in this paper recently by Joffrey uh, et al on the blue acceleration, if we go to the next slide, you can see that he sort of articulated this as the Anthropocene Ocean and the scramble for the ocean. Um, and the idea that there's three competing claims which are all interrelated. And of course, uh, you know, this is food, material and space. And all of these are overlapping and making it an incredibly complex environment for governance. And that's where I want to kind of bring in the role of the future, because as Sid, you know, has, and Christina in their paper have so clearly laid out, uh, there's many different ways that we can apply resilience thinking. And the talk that I'm giving here is about trying to kind of give this bigger picture for how we can make sense of all this complex and actually tie it into uh, really building ambition around the High Seas Treaty. So today, you know, with, with everything that uh, that Sid has said in the previous presentation and also what many of us know, we live in a world that's characterized by volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And that certainly uh, characterizes our ocean. And the only real certainty here is that the future will be uh, surprising. And this has a number of implications. So if we go to the next slide, I think that what I want to say here is futures thinking can be a powerful approach to unlock complex problems in an increasingly uncertain world. Sometimes when trying to move forward something like the High Seas Treaty, the complexity of it, the many different actors, the kinds of trade-offs that are being made can seem uh, impossible. And I would say that the future can be extremely powerful from taking us out of the immediacy of the present and throwing us into the future to think about the implications of the decisions we're making today. The future doesn't exist. We make it and we shape it by the actions and the choices that we take today. And so this really comes into a more formal way of thinking about these things, which is built uh, at least in part on resilience thinking. And that's about anticipatory governance. So how do we govern in the present in order to adapt 
or shape uncertain futures. And that's very much what about applying resilience is about, because fundamentally resilience is about managing change, whether that change is very slow and uh, sort of expected or very fast, sudden and surprising. So moving on from there, what is a scenario then? So a scenario in this context is a coherent, internally consistent and plausible description of a potential future trajectory of a system. So we're bringing together these elements of complexity, configuring them in different ways and trying to say something about you know, where that might take us um, in the oceans. So I think that one thing that's really interesting to think about here in the context of the high seas is we can see scenarios as a way to create narrative simulations of ocean governance. And if we take those the resilience principles and think, okay, well, how do we manage something like polycentricity? How do we manage many different kinds of organizations trying to interact with different interests? Of course, there's formal processes that you can follow, but actually spending time taking yourself out of the present and trying to think about different ways that we can imagine how that might work, then gives us a lot of insight into how we might do that now. And it's also about thinking about okay, if the future might take us in this direction, how do we ensure that we have flexibility in the present to deal with that if that happens? I'm now gonna go into some more sort of specific examples connected to a project uh, that I did out of my PhD on trying to understand different trajectories of global ocean governance called radical ocean futures. And I'm going to sort of like highlight uh, some specific points and metaphors that I think are important in the context of tr us trying to collectively raise the ambition of the High Seas Treaty. So if we can go to uh, the next slide. Um, so yeah, this was a using science fiction to take a lot of what we know about marine science, both sort of social and ecological and technological change, and put that into the future and 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 uh, you know be able to make sense of the present more in that sense. So the first one here is fishing, and the idea here is that. We know, as I pointed out in the beginning of the presentation, that there's a scramble for the ocean. There's so many different industries, different actors who want a slice of the ocean economy. And this kind of scenario of fishing takes that to the extreme, where you have one large company that's responsible for, responsible for most uh, of marine um, protein production, and almost all of protein production on the planet comes from the ocean. Because this is something really common, and I think this is a lot of uh, pressure in terms of getting this really right around the High Seas Treaty, that there's the sense that the ocean is really going to be so critically important in the future. And I just want to emphasize that point. So this really takes it to the extreme. And the, pu the purpose then of that first scenario is to really say, okay, if you had uh, this kind of ocean industrialization kind of went to its extreme, what would that mean? What would that mean for marine biodiversity? Because here, they, in this scenario, they managed to quite successfully uh, privatize global food security, but at a massive cost to ecosystems uh, and to ecosystem resilience. And as we know, once uh, we sort of lose a lot of those fragile ecosystems in the high seas, they're not coming back again. The next scenario, um, what I really want to draw out here in the context of the high seas is Sid pointed out that you have these kind of three interacting factors around climate change. So you have the, the warming of the ocean, deoxygenation, uh, so oxygen coming out of the ocean, and of course acidification. And this scenario really tries to take the idea that what if all of these things continue to both happen, but then we hit a number of tipping points in the ocean where it failed to be able to continue to sequester carbon to the same degree. It failed to be able to support biodiversity, and what would that mean? And again, we're in a critical stage in the next five or 10 years about negotiating and trying to build uh, uh, a sort of a present which can ensure make to make sure that we don't go down this kind of direction so actually exploring what that might look like and bringing that back to the negotiations today can be critically important to try to shift our perspective and and how we try to strive for a different level of ambition moving to the third scenario now this is relevant i think in the context of small island uh, developing states and you know here the idea is that as we know, there's a lot of voices who are marginalized and people often talk about increasing uh, voices of, you know, uh, less powerful actors, marginalized groups, uh, indigenous people. But this isn't, it's often like bring them into the process, but not really and not to be fully engaged. So this scenario sort of explores the idea of actually shifting sovereignty and 
having where a lot of these uh, other groups have much more uh, influence and, and, and access to benefits and a lot of the things that are just theorized now. And that's a really great way to sort of point out, well, okay, if we actually want to be serious about this and make sure that the future is different to our past, what do we need to change in terms of both uh, the design of any instrument around the high seas and then, of course, how we engage with all the other actors around it. So that's critically important. The fourth scenario um, is about really casting us into the future. And I think this is the most optimistic one. And this is really exciting from where we are right now in this process of, of moving towards the High Seas Treaty. It's It sort of posits a future where we actually do have a flourishing ocean and things are going really well. And a combination of applying new technologies, uh, supporting ecosystem restoration, human ingenuity, groups coming together, you know, if a lot of these kind of resilience principles were brought to bear, that we could have a flourishing ocean. And then we can use that as a powerful statement to say, okay, we've reached this. What does it take to, if we build back from that future back to the present, what would it take in order to be able to actually reach that kind of future? Uh, and I think that that's really important to do that because, you know, we we don't only want to focus on the, the negative trends and the ways that the the ocean is changing for the worse, but also if we engage collectively and are able to uh, have a high seas treaty and are able to resolve many of these challenges that we face in terms of the the other actors that are interested in the, the ocean and address this scramble for the for the ocean, uh, then we can have a flourishing ocean. And what would it take um, to get there? So all of these scenarios then are kind of provocations as a way to say if certain things come together, if certain trends express themselves, then we can have a wildly different kind of sets of futures. And that really means that when we're all sitting here today around the negotiating table and, P and we're like looking at the next round of negotiations, it's really important to try to think about how can we use the future to push us out of the, the kind of day-to-day -day challenges and constraints and try to think of you know, innovative solutions for how we can come up to this. Uh, how we can um, raise the ambition. Because I think that it's really critical that these scenarios and any kind of scenarios are not there to be accurate predictions necessarily of the future. Partly they'll be right and partly they'll be wrong, but they're all plausible trajectories and they all give us the ability to kind of see signals and be able to pick up on things that are happening right now. And so I think in that sense, it can be a really, really powerful tool. And so what I would say is that the relationship between the resilience principles and uh, the and and the and futures is that futuring allows us a way of sort of bringing in and, and exploring what would it be like if we were able to successfully achieve the implementation of a more resilient approach, resilient approach to both our institutions uh, and our ecosystems. So I'll if we go to the final slide, yes. So that's what I was just talking about, the, the role of the future in raising the ambition for the BBNJ Treaty. And I will leave it there if we go to the final slide and thank everyone um, for listening. And uh, I hope you got a sense there of, and feel that this can be a, an interesting and useful approach. Thank you. Thanks a million, Andrew, uh, for this enlightening uh, presentation. And uh, I, it was amazing. And, and thank you again for your participation uh, today and for taking us into the future. So before we move to the uh, question and answer session, let me give me the floor to Christina Jurdi, who will come um, back on these key tools to help build ocean resilience beyond national jurisdiction via the BBNG agreement. So over to you, Christina. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Arlie. Thank you very much, Andrew and Sid and Ambassador for your illuminating remarks so far. As I realize we are a little bit pressed for time now, I'm just going to um, highlight some of the key points from what we have heard and to advertise this new IUCN um, infographic that we are releasing today as well that my colleagues have helped put together based on the article. 
And I'm not a visual person, but I was so taken with their efforts to try to encapsulate a relatively complex article concept theory uh, into uh, illustration. So I'm just going to try to introduce this really quickly. As we heard from Sid, the, um, the seven principles of resilience that were elaborated at Stockholm, I had the pleasure of encountering when I visited Stockholm Resilience Center in 2018 to talk about the impacts of a changing ocean in a high CO2 world and what the implications are for management. I realized that these seven principles help to provide a systematic approach really to thinking through what are the steps necessary in an ocean with the stressors that we know um, on the right, but also new stressors coming through, the cumulative impact of these stressors, new information coming out about marine heat waves that can entirely disrupt regional and sub-regional ecosystems, as I've saw, seen just even off the coast of California in 2015. Next slide, please. So if we're going to be building our ecological resilience, we need to be thinking how can we integrate these core components of safeguarding connectivity, establishing highly protected MPAs and networks into the, the BBNJ agreement. We have the foundation there, but we need to make sure that all are playing by the same um, guidelines by the same principles by recognizing the same fundamental ecological imperatives of acting together to ensure ecological um, resilience, ecological um, integrity, structures, functions, and biodiversity. Next slides, please. That's, and we recognize that it is the institutions that are making these decisions, the existing institutions, as well as the institutions that will be um, developed under the BBNJ agreement itself. Um, we need to have that knowledge-based decision-making that is recognizing multiple forms of knowledge, multiple forms of values and perspectives that are not just, as we've seen from Andrew Mary, about short-term satisfaction, but actually trying to address longer-term needs, concerns, and a very concerning future. That was, so the BBNJ science body is a fundamental component because it can hopefully both be reviewing what's going on at present, but also keeping that important eye on the future. What are the other scientists in the community um, exploring? What are they finding? How do we better transfer this new information into decision making, not only at the BBNJ level, but ensure and enable the other sectors and regions to benefit from the same scientific information? Next slide, please. That was because we are in a system of multiple organizations that are theoretically acting together. The whole foundation for polycentric governance is that we're all swimming in the same way. But what we're seeing are the real challenges in the world of BBNJ, where you have conflicting interests, you have growing act levels of activities, and we have that um, surprise of new types of activities, geoengineering, um, open ocean aquaculture. How are we going to cope with those as a society? How are we going to manage for the betterment of all humankind? Um, so here it's really um, an opportunity under the BBNJ agreement to make sure that we're all playing by the same rules, that we're all focused in like these creatures swimming in the same direction in order to ensure that we're actually coming to that better future that we all hope um, our cooperation will achieve together. And then finally, in the next slide, just to wrap up, we will be sharing um, the next slide. Um, this infographic today that was just to get it out that we're trying to paint a big picture that ecological resilience depends in these days of a changing ocean on firm institutional foundations. And it's only by we all playing together, heading in the same direction, hoping that we can do what is best for humankind and for ocean kind that we'll be able to survive into the latter half of the 21st century as well as into the 22nd century. So thank you all for your attention. Final slide, just to show that it is possible to align divergent interests. Uh, this picture of the fish that are swimming vertically instead of horizontally. We have to be able to challenge our expectations and recognize that we need to continue to learn and learn together. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Christina. That was great. Um, so we we don't have much time uh, remaining, but we will move quick to the Q and A session. And uh, my first question. So I, if I can ask all the the panelists and speakers to turn on their cameras and microphone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So my first question is uh, to Sid, uh, for Sid. So why is learning important for building ocean resilience and how can the BBNG contribute to it? Right. Um, thanks, Aurelie. That's a, that's a great question. Um, in fact, uh, that, that's very much related to the, the, the fifth resilience principle that we talked about. And learning is really important for building resilience in socio-ecological systems. And there are a couple of reasons. And as I said before, the first one is that the socio-ecological systems are continuously developing and changing. So the knowledge that we have of these systems is uh, also changing and is always incomplete and partial. So um, in order to build resilience, we need to have a better understanding of what is, of what is going on in the socio-ecological systems. And it becomes even more important in the case of the ocean uh, because not only is the ocean changing due to climate change and resilience, but also we uh, there is most of the ocean is, is unexplored. So uh, we have major uh, scientific knowledge gaps in terms of uh, uh, diversity, uh, species, uh, key slow variables and feedbacks, and there are so many other things. And most of the ocean is unseen and unknown as well. So that makes learning uh, re, uh, very crucial, very important for building resilience. And there are ways in which the, the treaty could contribute to learning and knowledge as well. Uh, as uh, Christina uh, just said, and as we've shown in the article, um, through, through the scientific and technical body, which should be a, re a relevant action point, um, it, it can be enabled to acquire relevant uh, scientific information through, uh, for example, a dedicated and coordinated um, research body that ensures long-term monitoring and um, and the BBNJ treaty me uh, mechanisms need to be um, informed by the outcomes of um, uh, the ocean decade of ocean science uh, um, uh, for sustainable development and other such uh, multinational regional uh, global scientific initiatives and so these are the two main things that we've discussed in the article the, the two main ways in which the treaty is going to contribute to uh, uh, learning and also uh, by broadening participation. So research and exploration and all these different um, uh, options that we've talked about are not the only way to uh, encourage learning, but learning is enhanced through a broad participation of a variety, the diversity of stakeholders as well. So when diversity of stakeholders from, uh, the, from the states, from the local and in indigenous communities, from the private sector and youth, women. So all these diversity of, uh, this diversity of uh, stakeholders participate in the decision-making mechanisms. Every one of them will learn from each other. So this is, this is another way. And finally, polycent polycentricity also, because it, it, it involves uh, broader participation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sid, for your very comprehensive uh, answer. Um, and I have a, another question to all. Um, so what do you think is the appetite from ocean institutions to respond to these principles, considering conflicting values and mandates? So maybe Christina or Mary, Andrew? I'd like to hear Andrew's <laughs> answer first, and then I'll go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that resilience is something that has been quite uh, like there's a lot of interest in the in the term and trying to understand how to make things more resilient. And I would say that it probably has gotten to the ocean um, later in some degrees outside the scientific community, at least in terms of policy. So I think in that sense, there could be quite a lot of uh, appetite for it. I think it's really good because it kind of breaks down a lot of the big mess that people are trying to face when they're looking at ocean governance. Often people kind of look at it and run in the other direction. I think the resilience principles are a really great way to kind of uh, unpack and deconstruct uh, the kinds of specific institutional and ecosystem challenges and then find ways to bring them back together that really make sense. And especially if you're talking about complexity and social ecological systems again those can seem like quite big terms but when you actually break it down and say okay 
but specifically, how do we manage conflicting uh, governing mandates? How do you as a sort of business organization or an indigenous group fit into this larger context? Or uh, what does it actually mean to introduce a, or why does a, a sort of network of strong marine protected areas actually help us to, to restore ecosystems? It, it gives you some very powerful language and some really strong tools, I think, for, for doing that. So I would say that's the, the biggest benefit and that there is some appetite. Thank you. Christina? Ah, you're muted. The science is showing that um, climate change is already changing the health, abundance, and distribution of fish and fish stocks. Um, it, they're making them smaller, they're making them less robust, they're um, compressing the habitat for tuna, for billfish, because of lowered oxygen levels. Uh, that's what we're seeing are a concurrence of confluence of impacts on the commercial um, fish stocks. And these fish also live in an ecosystem that supports the fish to be able to survive. And if we don't protect and maintain the ecosystem, we're going to be losing the fish. That is the reason why these fishermen are going out there. Uh, similarly, we need to be you know, taking into consideration that we're going to be getting larger waves, that there's more information out there that is constantly telling us how the ocean is changing. It's hard mm -hmm. to keep track of, but if we don't cooperate in sharing information, sharing data, sharing predictions, sharing um, concerns, we're all going to be sinking, unfortunately, alone. That was so I, uh, my concern and in some ways perverse hope is that the growing impacts of climate change, of pollution, deoxygenation, heat waves is really going to force us all into a ever decreasing boat that we all have to paddle in the same direction. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Christina. So at this stage, uh, I want to uh, thank all the attendees for your interest and uh, indicate to you that we have now reached the one hour that was planned for uh, the duration of the webinar. So those of you who have further commitments or want to leave the meeting now, you're welcome to do so. And we still have a couple of good questions so that came in the chat box. So uh, for those of you who would like to stay a little bit longer, please please stay online with us. Um, so my, probably my, uh, I have a question for Christina again. So from Said Amit from Guyana, um, in recognition of the various issues in managing and improving ocean resilience, how should the BBNG uh, treaty with the various entities and bodies who already approve activities in the um, ABNG? So uh, how should the BBNG treat with the various entities and bodies, whoever, yeah, it's a bit like, um, yeah. Okay, I, I um, thank you for the complicated question. I think, I mean, this is the, the fundamental question of the interrelationship of the BBNG agreement with other bodies. And what I'm beginning to see in terms of the range of um, options is really one where the, existing bodies retain their core competence for managing fishing and shipping but we have to recognize that there's a shared competence and a shared responsibility for managing the impacts of these activities on biological diversity the conventional biological diversity recognizes that conservation is a common concern of all states and of all humankind so i think we're moving beyond and we have to move beyond a siloed ocean where single organizations have responsibility for managing issues of global concern. That's the regional fisheries management organizations, for example, may have the best information on stock um, assessments and where they are, but do they have the best information about the um, species that are being caught? Do they have the best information about the changes in salinity of oxygen that are gonna be driving these species into new places? Ocean health is something that is a global concern, and hence we all need to be involved. Thanks. Thank you very much, Christina. Um, I have another question from Guyana as well, and uh, uh, this person is asking, um, Said is asking, can any of the panelists speak to the challenges faced by a small island developing states um, in negotiating under the instrument towards fulfillment and full attention to the issues they have presented? So, 
I don't know if you want, uh, it has been mentioned by uh, Ambassador Tevi. I don't know, Sid, if you want to add a little bit on the uh, small island de developing states um, involvement in the BBNG. Yeah, sure. Um, so as the ambassador highlighted that the small island developing states are um, at the front lines of, uh, the, of, of this uh, whole climate emergency. And um, the ocean is at, is at a tipping point and the small island states are the most vulnerable. And uh, these, uh, these uh, concerns have been reflected in the BBNG negotiations as well. For example, um, through uh, there are a few things, uh, a few uh, key points that the, the pieces are concerned about. So the first one uh, can be the, uh, the traditional knowledge. Uh, the pieces uh, are really, um, uh, it's, it's really important for them. Uh, and then there is uh, the benefit sharing as well. So the pieces support um, uh, monetary as well as non-monetary benefits. And um, but as we all know, the, the negotiations uh, are a challenging process. There's always going to be two sides. And um, I hope that this, uh, the, 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 the COVID, uh, the, the gap that we've had and, you know, the, the space that we have this time, it gives us uh, an opportunity to uh, um, get back to each other and, you know, rethink about some, some of the options. It's challenging, but I'm, I'm still optimistic. Thank There's no you. other option. Yeah, thank you very much, Sid. Um, I have a question uh, for Christina from CAM and MIS Fund. So we are still, at least in some areas, working in silos and working with legislative remits of what particular departments can or cannot do. How can we help bring change towards more polycentric thinking and towards working all together? <laughs> Well, it's a very good question that I'm going to dodge and ask Andrew, um, because I think some of these futures thinking um, scenarios can really help us to realize what is in store for us. And I would just say in response to the previous question, um, on small island developing states who are swimming in a, a very large ocean, I think the, the past decade has really underscored the intimate connectivity of all of us with the high seas. When we started this discussion, it was the high seas were out there and relatively unknown and unexplored. But as new findings about the vast ocean twilight zone and these crazy fish, uh, lanternfish who swim up to the um, dark waters by night in order to evade um, their predators and then swim back down and take all this productivity with them, the biological carbon pump. We are connected vertically as well as horizontally, and it's a reality that we can no longer ignore and that we have to understand that our lives as well as our livelihoods depend on these functioning ecosystems um, that we are just now starting to explore. Andrew, over to you. <laughs> sure. So, I mean, I, I think you point to a, a great you know, question there around the idea that like, okay, fine, we understand that people, you know, need to, that we have to have multiple centers of authority, they have to work together and collaborate in order to get to a better outcome. But the actual practical uh, challenges of doing that when people are expected to represent their particular organizational perspective uh, is very challenging. But I think there are some really interesting uh, tools that are sort of being developed around participatory um, workshops on how you actually get people to kind of move themselves along and change their positions and that can be stuff even as simple as having a group of people in the room and saying okay but you today are going to represent the small island developing uh, states and you are going to represent the oil and gas industry and you're going to so you actually change the basis for their representation and run almost like these sets of simulations where people are forced to take a different kind of perspective and that might then lead to potentially ideas coming up that seemed untenable before, uh, but are now you actually realize, oh, I could see we could move that way. So you need to find ways of actually shifting perspective. Obviously, there's a question of getting people to be open to those kinds of processes, but I think it's really important to push um, different kinds of tools with, uh, with people to try to start with talking to each other in different ways. And through that, you can then start to see perhaps a solution for how you actually change the institutional relationship between them. Um, so that's a big question, but I'll stop there. <laughs> if I can just yeah, sure. um, add something, one of the um, 
avenues that was to get people on the same page and to understand where we are is through environmental assessments. We're seeing this in the Atlantic through the iAtlantic program, where scientists from countries all across the, I, the Atlantic Ocean Basin come together to really assess the current status, the trends, as well as the cumulative impacts of multiple stressors on both a ocean basin as well as sub-regions as a whole. If you could actually get the variety of stakeholders um, involved in these joint ocean assessments, then everybody would start to have a better understanding of what truly is at stake. And if you start to look at future ocean stressors of where we're headed and where certain trends are going, then you create a far better platform. We have some experience with that in the large marine ecosystem projects that the GEF has been funding. I think it may be useful to start considering how could we do that um, and apply it in areas beyond national jurisdiction on a more consistent basis. Thanks. Thank you very much, Christina. And with this very wise word, I think we're coming to the end of the webinar. So I would like to sincerely thank all the panelists and the contributors to, the, to this webinar. And thank you very much to all attendees for your attention and participation today. So we are planning to have additional webinars on the BBNG topic in our series, Building Ambition for the New High Seas Treaty. And next one in about one month. So stay tuned and we are looking forward to seeing you again. So uh, Mina, if you want to, Say a few words. You mute. No, thank you very much. I was just going to add to the very long row of thank yous, but but most primarily really to putting forward some actually real concrete, already established and proven principles and how these can be applied to areas beyond national jurisdiction. So the real work is really to just see the the, the linkages, but you know what we're actually seeing, the impact of climate change in the ocean. And the fact by applying these principles, we can actually bring the ocean back from the brink, prosper uh, for future generation for the benefit of, of humankind. So that's really, I think this was a very concise way of putting this together and, and really emphasizing the need to show that this is what we need to be doing. So thank you everyone again. And also yeah. thank you to Sweden for hosting this webinar. Yeah. So have a good day all and goodbye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.